Uh, you know, I was a bit reluctant to talk about this. I was asked to, you know, if this would be a topic I could research. And it's a really interesting topic, but talking about it publicly, I had two reservations. The first is if somebody doesn't know much about Chinese medicine and then this is what they see, they're going to think we're all witchcraft, <laughs> you know, and but this is just one tiny slender thread in a huge tapestry of Chinese medicine. This is just one tiny, tiny, not even a thousandth <laughs> of what Chinese medicine is. So please nobody judge Chinese medicine based on, you know, this topic. And the second reason I was a little reluctant was because, you know, I wonder if somebody could be, if somebody could think this is cool and be tempted to try to do it rather than treat it. And yeah, you know, there are creepy people in the world and this is a creepy topic. <laughs> but anyway, I did it. So I just want to say, you know, the news says respect ghosts and spirits, but keep a distance from them. And while I talked about ghosts in a previous one, somehow, I mean, all over the world, everybody has a concept of ghosts, but this is like a particularly specific concept that I think is creepier than ghosts, if that can be. <laughs> so um, let me get this going. Okay. A uh, practical dictionary of Chinese medicine is Nigel Weissman's like pretty amazing kind of encyclopedia. Um, and according to him, you know, there are a number of things goo has been historically. So if you say, what is goo? There's not one answer to it. And so it has to do often with poisonous insects um, that cause problems, maybe parasites and stuff like that. Um, and it does have like a sexual aspect to it at times. We're going to see a quote about that too. Then in Neijing, it says about like heat in the lower abdomen with pain and white turbid urine, which seems kind of like a different category. And finally, it's this creepy black magic in, you know, a poison that's derived from, he says insects, but it's just as often snakes or other kinds of things. Um, and so, and then in modern times, there's some people who use this concept for kind of strange, difficult to cure diseases like Lyme disease and stuff like that. So you can see it's not one thing. It's been many things. And so if you say, what is goo? It depends on where and, you know, the time period and so forth. Let's look at the earliest mentions. It was a character in the oracle bones, which are like 5,000 years old or older. Um, and, you know, so some of the questions in the oracle bones, there are sick teeth. Is it due to goo? Um, king's bones. It doesn't say what's wrong with them, but you imagine they're kind of eroding away or something. Is it due to goo or not? Um, somebody named Mother Bing, is she going to die from goo or ha did she die from goo? You know, you can't really tell all the details of the question. Here's some oracle bone versions of the character. So there's some more stuff here. I have always too many slides. So, you know, I'll make sure that the handouts are available and, and you can read some of it on your own. Shuo Wen Jiezi is this Han Dynasty dictionary where the guy who wrote it wanted to figure out the earliest meaning of the characters. He was sometimes wrong, sometimes right, but he thought the earliest meaning of Gu was this thing called chong in the abdomen. So what is this word chong? It's like the top part of the character for gu. You can see here it is by itself. It's a term that is like a big category of things. It's basically any creepy crawly thing. Okay. So it could be, um, you know, like worms or, or snakes or lizards or um amphibians or you know just like any creepy crawly thing including mythological creepy crawly things including invisible creepy crawly things so you know this is often translated as worms and sometimes it is worms including parasite 
type worms. But, you know, Chong has a much broader range of meaning than only worms. And we're going to see that they mention a lot of other stuff. And so there's this um, Zhuo Zhuan, which forgive my pronunciation, I, I can't really speak Chinese, but yeah, I can read. <laughs> Um, so this is an ancient commentary on a history book. And so it says the Marquis of someplace called Jin um, called for a doctor from the state of Qin, which later took over all of China. And um, I have to adjust my screen because I can't see stuff because I'm seeing your lovely faces. Okay, now I can see. The Earl of the state of Jin sent a doctor named Yi He, which is Dr. Harmony, <laughs> to see him. And so the doctor said, your disease cannot be cured. This is called being too close to the ladies' bedchambers. You get what he means, right? Too much sex. The disease resembles goo, but it's not due to ghosts or food. So he's saying it's not actually goo, but like goo it seems he's implying is due to ghosts or food. But this guy, uh, the Marquis of Jin, is due to delusion that will destroy his will. And because of this, you're going to die. <laughs> the mandate of heaven will not protect you. So like, boy, that doctor doesn't have a good bedside manner explaining things, does he? Um, and then later in Zhuo Zhuan, in the same book, um, Somebody named Zhao Meng asks, what is goo? And the doctor answers, it's born of indulgence in lust pollution. That's actually one character and it's really hard to translate. It's actually sometimes used for external evils that invade, um, but it does have a very sexual connotation, which we saw in the previous slide. Um, but it means something that's a little bit dirty. I mean, we use the word dirty for sex in English sometimes too, you know? And so this implies like a, a pollution, a dirtiness that's going to cause damage. But here it's very specifically referring to lust. So Gu is born of indulgence in lust pollution with delusions. In writing, it's a dish plus creepy crawlies, that character Chong. So you can see over here, um, that the bottom part is a, is a dish and the top part is um, three worms, actually, or three, you know, chong, whatever they are, on top of the dish. Um, and so that's what he says. We'll be talking about more about chong in a dish as we go through. He also says it could be a grain moth, a moth that, you know, you know how bugs eat grain and stuff like that. And in the Zhou Yi, which is like kind of the original name of the Yi Jing, women confusing men is wind over wind below the mountain. And, you know, the Xunhua wind is the oldest daughter and below like the mountains are the youngest son. And so he's kind of saying this is like an older woman taking advantage of a young guy, like a cougar, you know. Um, and, he, you know, so that's a hexagram. One of the hexagrams, hexagram 18, is called Gu. And all of this, he says, it's all the same. So here's hexagram 18, Gu. Um, it's so hard to translate because it's so, so, so ancient, ancient. So I kind of, you know, like plagiarized a little bit Richard Rutt and Stephen Field and like thought about what I thought, but I didn't just totally translate this in my own, of my own effort. But I don't really have much to say about it. It's just not really clear what goo is from this hexagram. You know, I mean, it's not a good thing. We know it's not a good thing, but it doesn't really give us any information to help us understand what is goo. So you can look at that on your own. You can pause the video or you could look at the handouts. Anyway, Joel John also says goo is a dish plus creepy crawly things. Okay, we already know that's how the character is made. Um, it's engendered by dark pollution. It's that word that before I said lust pollution, but it's got the word like darkness in it. Like 
I think that's the last day of the lunar month, which would be like a day when the moon is almost non-existent, but it also can mean just darkness. And then the ghosts of those who died by beheading or dismemberment are also goo. Ooh. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gu is mentioned in Neijing a few times, but again, it doesn't really explain what exactly is Gu, but it doesn't talk about bugs in a dish um, in Neijing. It has this one sentence um, from Su Wen 19. The lower abdomen feels, I don't know, twisted. Again, Neijing is super old, so sometimes it's really hard to translate. It's the lower abdomen is hot and painful, and there's a white discharge. This is called Gu. And so remember above Nigel Weissman said one of the meanings of Gu is like the lower abdomen or lesser abdomen having hot pain and white turbid urine. So, you know, that comes from Neijing. Okay, so things become more clear maybe when we get a little bit later in time and we get to some medical books. So are you okay with this early stuff? Do you have questions? Okay, so there's this book called Jubing Yuan Ho Lun, um, which was commissioned by the Cui dynasty, which only lasted like 37 years, but it was a really important time in history. And this is a very important book in terms of Chinese medicine. You can see it's a pretty early date. So the Cui dynasty was after the, was before the, before the Tang, um, and then the Tang dynasty came right after that. And so Chao Yuan Fang was the chief editor of this. And so there's a section that says, that's called Gu Infixation. This word infixation, I mean, I don't know if that's how you want to translate it. That's how Weissman translates it. But here's what Chao Yuan Fang says. Infixation means residing. And actually in Chinese, it's Ju means Ju. It's like pronounced the same. Um, so this is a way Chinese literature likes to define things, like take one word and then define it by another word that's pronounced the same or almost the same. So infixation is something that's like lingering and reside, residing inside the body. It refers to a disease that's continuously stagnant and stays in the patient. Um, people with infixation can easily die. And then gu is one of these types of infixation that it's in the category of gathering snakes and chong, other kinds of creepy crawlies as well. They're contained in a bowl and they're made to eat each other up. And then the one that remains the last chong standing is at the end has the power of all of them and it becomes the gu and it can like make strange mutations um, people who make it treated with respectful attention, because you make a mistake with it, you could poison yourself, I guess. Um, they use the toxins to harm other people, and it's often put in food and drink. He also says people who get struck by goo have various symptoms, heart oppression, abdominal pain. It eats away the fat zong and then they die. <laughs> They're chronic and acute types. The acute type, you could die within 10 to 20 days. The chronic type can just be chronic for years and it, you know, it's moving around the abdomen and they become weaker and weaker and their bones and joints feel heavy. And then it has episodes where there's pain in the heart region and abdomen and whatever they eat transforms into the goo and it, you know, more slowly eats up the organs and then they die. Um, and then once they die, it can seep out of the body and um, kind of invade nearby people, polluting them. So it's called goo infixation. So, you know, if you think about like certain types of diseases, like there are lots of diseases that people get from caring for the dead. Like Ebola is one of them that it's often transmitted by the rituals that, you know, people do to take care of the dead person. So, you know, whether this is supernatural or not, there are diseases that can travel from the dead person to the, you know, living. 
Okay, Ban Sao Gang Mu is a really famous Ming Dynasty book that goes over the herbs one by one. And it does have an entry for Gu Chong. So Chong remembers the creepy crawly stuff. He, in Ban Sao Gang Mu, he quotes so many earlier books. So there's an earlier book by someone named Chen who says ancient people who are foolish made Gu to try and get wealthy. They put a hundred chong in an earthenware jar and closed it up and then waited a year before they opened it. And one chong will have eaten the others. And that's the goo. It can make itself invisible like a ghost or spirit and cause problems for people. Um, it bites people to death and then it can come out of their orifices, which, yeah, like parasites, you know, I mean, this is creepy. This wasn't, I didn't pick this topic. <laughs> Um, I hope you're not eating dinner as you're watching this. Um, believers gather it at that time when it's leaving a person's orifices and dry it in the sun. And then if somebody gets goo, if somebody gets goo, they can take the ashes of the dried goo and take it orally as medicine. And so he says this is the idea that things, similar things can sometimes control similar things. He also said, whenever you use goo to cure goo, you have to know which what it was made from. So for example, for snake type, if it's made from snakes, you have to use centipedes. Or if it's from the centipede type, you have to use the goo that comes from using toads. <laughs> and for the toad type, you have to use a snake goo. So apparently centipedes can kill snakes and toads can kill centipedes and snakes can kill toads. So that's why you have to use, you have to use a goo that comes from some kind of chong that can kill the other kind of chong that the person is struck with. So that's like rock, paper, scissors, isn't it? Um, yeah. Okay. So Li Shijian, the author of Ban Sao Gang Mu, says that they're not all the same, but they do all mutate and cause problems. They're often done through food and drink. Um, the goo master, we'll come across that term a few times. So the person who's making goo will receive good luck and profit. So petty people, you know, small people like, you know, like criminal types and so forth, make it to get rich quick. Um, in the South, there's so many different kinds. So this is one thing we're going to see. It's associated with the South of China, and there are a lot of minority people in the South. And so it has an association with those minority people, <laughs> which um, I kind of sympathize with the minority people. The Chinese kept pushing them out of their lands, just like you know, the British and the French kept pushing the Native Americans out of their lands. And, you know, so, yeah. Um, so the treatment, according to Li Shijian, comes from that guy, Chen Zhangqi, who was quoted before, burn it to ash and take a little orally, the patient will recover. And Zhang Jiebin has a really, really long section He's a Ming Dynasty famous doctor. He has a really long section on it. And Gu is a kind of toxin. And here we're going to start to see some of this kind of imperialist <laughs> northern Chinese people. It rarely appears in the central plains of China, which is like the main part of China. It's transmitted from generation to generation in Guangxi and Guangdong, which are in the south, the deep south of China, near Vietnam and so forth, by people in the remote mountains. On the fifth day of the fifth lunar month, they fill a vessel with um, snakes, venomous snakes, centipedes, and toads, and they allow them to eat each other up and wait till only one of them is alive, and that one is the goo. And then there's this other name we keep coming across, but Nobody knows how to translate it. So I don't know. I mean, that's just a name for it. Okay. So then they secretly put it in food and drink of someone they want to harm. And then that person gets sick from it. They'll have illness and pain in their heart region and abdomen. It feels like the insects or the chong or whatever they are gnawing on them. 
Um, they'll have vomiting and diarrhea that looks like decayed silk floss. That's a weird statement. And at first I didn't understand it, but I'll like, when we come to another passage, then I think we can understand this decayed silk floss. What is that? Well, we'll see in a while. Um, if it's not treated right away, it eats up all their organs and they'll die. Um, but there's a acute type and a chronic type, you know, repeating. There's a lot of repeat going on here. He continues, it's said that in this same Southern region, people kill venomous snakes and then cover the dead snake with certain herbs, sprinkle a little water on it. And after a few days, there's like a fungus growing, a mold, something like that growing there. They powder the fungus and mix it with rice wine to poison people. In the beginning, they don't get sick, but when they drink wine again, that triggers it and the poison works. So, you know, what is this decayed silk floss and what is this fungus? This is somebody like on YouTube, you should follow Uncle Baitzow. He has these amazing videos about like harvesting and making various herbal things. So, you know, you could search in English and I think he'll come up. But in one of his videos, he makes um, Shen Chu, that, you know, masa fermentata, I think it's called. And so you have to grind a bunch of stuff together and put it in a pan and then you put certain leaves on top and then you cover it up and leave it for a while and a mold grows on it because it is fermented. There is like a mold and look at this. Before it said decayed silk floss, I can see that, right? It's like, looks almost like cotton ball that's like not very pretty or something like that. We're going to see reference to like a fungus again. So, so this making Shen Chu has nothing to do with goo, yet there is some similarity in some of the technique. So, you know, sometimes I have to search for images of things to like really understand what I'm translating, but I think this helped me understand it a lot. So now here's the part. <laughs> Here's the part where we can really see how those Northern Chinese men are behaving badly in the South, except they think they're not behaving badly. Okay, so many common lewd women join themselves with Northern people, and by people, he means men, <laughs> um, and become attached to them all the time. So he's saying these Northern men, when they have to travel to the South for business, or if they're a government official, they find a woman to have a relationship with, even if they have a family back at home, but you know, they're not gonna sit at home and do nothing. So they find some woman and they spend time with her. And now they're calling her Lube when she's just trying to maybe feed her kids, get a little money, feed her kids or something. And then they wanna just go back home and abandon this woman who may even have had his kid. So, but like these Northern men, they think they're justified in doing that. Okay, so, so like Zhang Jiebin's spin on this is that these women are lewd and they're doing evil stuff. But like, I think we can also say the Northern men are not behaving appropriately either. Okay, so if the woman doesn't believe that the man is going to return. They secretly put toxins in his food and drink. And then when the Northern man wants to go home, they warn him, after you go, are you going to come back? And if he does, as he promises her, then she has a remedy to, you know, get rid of the goo. <laughs> but if he doesn't come back, then the goo is going to activate and he's going to, um, She'll get her revenge for him abandoning her. So there's that. Um, there's a similar story um, in another book, um, Snake Venom, that comes from growing a malign fungus. Remember the fungus part? Um, so again, he says, Luke, women on friendly terms with Northern people, meaning Northern men, put the medicine in their food and drink. They explain it. You better come back at a certain time. If you come back, I can fix your goo problem. But if you don't come back, you're going to die. And so you can imagine that 
if these women feel that the men are taking advantage of her, whether or not they actually have this black magic, they can freak out the guy and make him want to come back because he's afraid. Um, you know, so it may be just psychological warfare. And if the men believe it, they're going to, you know, try to <laughs> take care of her properly. Um, okay. So any questions so far? I do have a couple questions, actually. Yeah. Okay. So these accounts, are these more like, are these folklore? Or are these like, you know, actual accounts of things that happened? These are from medical texts by doctors who are, you know, high level scholars. So I believe that the doctors believe it. Now, where did they get their information from it? You know, they may have actually seen things they believe to be cases, or it may be that they heard stories from Northern men who returned. Um, so, you know, these are, there will be, we'll see a few stories from like Tales of the Strange, which are not written by doctors and are more questionable, but these are like legitimate doctors that are saying this. Um, that still doesn't mean that it's necessarily exactly precisely true, but these are not rumor mongers <laughs> or these are not like stories told to titillate and scare. Okay, got it, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Okay. Uh, regarding the two, so in the past, uh, the the people or the doctor or people using the do to to uh, to heal the patient or to control the people i think that these doctors writing this kind of stuff are trying to heal a patient with it and they use the ashes but not the actual goo itself but the people who are like practicing goo are often described as being, you know, basically minority people like these women from the South. Um, okay. So, you know, there are a lot of, of tribes in the South that still exist in Southern China. And so okay. Forth. Do they still, do, do the Chinese people in a minority group in China still use, use the gu, gu to uh for for medicine purpose or for religion purpose or for spiritual practice Do i they don't still use it i don't know because i just researched into old um books i didn't like research into modern stuff so i don't know but um my teacher one time was traveling in some small village in southern China with a friend of his and they went into some little you know tiny restaurant and they just felt something was really creepy and something was off and they thought "Ooh, I wonder if this is a goo place so even like modern people are like somewhat concerned about goo when they're in this territory and so they were so hungry they were starving that they just couldn't not eat and so what they did was they just got the hottest hot sauce that they you know the restaurant had and they just put on so much hot sauce that they were burning up and sweating and <laughs> everything but like they didn't get goo but at least we know that some modern people still worry about it <laughs> i see Thank i you don't so know much. if they practice it but you know people worry about it yeah i heard so many so many folk tales so many stories that related to do so i always thought the using do is a, do is a control people's behavior or control yeah. people's destiny We'll, I might see be wrong. Some, we'll see some of this controlling a person's behavior, but really goo is for like bad people practice goo. It's not like a, at least in all these old books, it's never a spiritual practice. It's like a, a practice of people who are trying to take advantage of someone else. Now, who knows what it's transformed? You know, this was 1624, for example. So in 400 years, who knows how the idea changed? I don't know. I okay, didn't think really go beyond this time period. Thank you so much. Sure. 
So there's some tests for goo, for example, apparently, if you spit into clean water, um, the spit should float. I, I've been meaning to try that and see if my spit floats because I just thought the spit would mix in. But if the spit sinks, then it's goo. And there are a couple other tests for if it's goo, but they're not so interesting. So you can read that on your own because I have lots of slides. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, Emily, you have a question? Hi, yeah, Lorraine. Um, I mean, I can ask it later, but um, it's maybe... fine. I just didn't see you. That's okay. In um, some maybe other cultures, if you were, say, extracting the poison of a snake, it could be used as a very healing, um, medicine. So I'm just wondering what you're really talking about is to poison someone and manipulate. It's not actually being used as a medicine. The person or, who does the goo is trying to harm someone. Yeah, it's, and they're trying to. I've just seen sometimes you see all those animals being put in a uh, decoction or a tincture to extract their um, venom yeah. or something like that. Yeah, snakes are used in Chinese medicine and also in folk medicine and also in food. Like if you go to a restaurant in southern China, Often, just like, you know, if you go to a Chinese restaurant here, they might have a fish tank and you could pick which fish you want, but they have snake tanks, you know, mm. in some restaurants in Southern China and stuff like that. And you can pick which snake you want and yeah, stuff like that. But this was directly to poison someone, cause harm. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. called, mostly it's called goo toxins mm -hmm. or, or goo poison. Um okay. So yeah, this is this is black magic, okay? Mm -hmm. And the doctors that are writing this stuff are telling you like what they know about it and how to remedy it if you have somebody who has is the victim of this. Okay. But as I said, in modern times, you know, there's somebody named Heiner Fruhoff who uses the concept of goo for things like Lyme disease. And like we can, I can mention that at the end. So you know, it's been so many different things at different times. Sure. Thank you. So this lists a bunch of symptoms. Um, and actually it would be interesting for somebody, I didn't stop and do this, but actually to think like, what could this be in modern medicine? If, if somebody came to the doctor and had all of these symptoms, is there some diagnosis we could come up with? Um, so I'm not going to just sit though and read you a list of symptoms. You can look at that on your own. Um, okay. And there's some pulses here, but again, I'm not going to read that because I have a lot of slides and there's like interesting stuff, at least to me, knowing what to avoid whenever there's a, whenever somebody's struck by goo, whenever there's a goo strike, you better record whatever the toxins were in. Like if you think, oh, it was in the rice wine that I drank, or oh, it was in the meal that they served me. For the rest of your life, you can't eat that same thing. So if it was in the rice wine, you can't drink rice wine anymore. If you do, the toxins will work. Do you remember that um, it said, one of them said it won't hit them right away, but if the, the next time they drink wine, it's gonna hit them. If they recover after using herbs, but from that time on, they can never again eat cold food or drink cold drinks. When cold food is eaten, it's going to engender the goo toxins and then it'll be too late to rescue them. We don't have to agree with this. We don't even have to think that goo is real, but this is what the doctor is saying. Zhang Jiebin is uh, one of the most famous Ming Dynasty doctors. He's you know high status doctor. So um, he is quoting from an earlier book. And then I decided I wanted to see what the earlier book actually said. And so this is, he tells this same story, but here I've gone back to the earlier book. In Zhang Jiebin's writing, he calls this the method of returning goo to its host. In other words, instead of you getting it, you want it to feed back to the host and get him sick or her sick so that you don't get sick. And he says, whenever going to some place like, you know, 
like the south of China, then there's everybody says there's goo down there. And it's surprisingly, he says, if you see somebody's door threshold and roof beams are all so clean with not a speck of dust or dirt, that family is raising goo. Isn't that weird that it's associated with super clean houses? Maybe like a laboratory, you have to keep it clean or it gets polluted. I don't know. Be careful to guard against it, he says. If there's no choice to but to eat their food and drink, like if you just have to eat there for whatever reason, secretly collect a piece of food in your hand when you first start to eat. And then eat and we've got a remedy for you. It's not going to hurt you. So he says, when you're done, go out with the piece of food that you collected from the meal and secretly bury it under a crossroads where the person walks. The goo will like make trouble in the household of the goo master and the goo master will then say, help me, help me, because the goo is like returning back to him. In addition, and perhaps during meals, let the host use the chopsticks first. I don't know how that was going to help, but that's what it says. Or ask outright, none of this food has goo. You're not trying to poison me with goo. Is that the way to talk to your host? <laughs> he also says, use chopsticks to pound the table with them and then eat. So I don't get how that's supposed to help, but that's what the passage says. In this way, the goo will do no harm. Um, and he's saying this was investigated and it's found to be true. So Zhang Jiebin continues two major methods to treat Gu. And so he talks about if the symptoms are all in the chest and, and diaphragm, like vomiting and stuff like that, then it's an upper type and you have to make them vomit. Um, if it's all abdominal pain and distension, it's the lower type, and then you have to induce a bowel movement. You can read the details on your own, right? You don't need me to read all that to you. <clears throat> and then we get to something that I find really interesting, the Da Zhang Jing, which is this Buddhist um, writing, um, says there is an incantation method to treat goo toxins and that other name that they have for it. When someone eats and drinks outside their home, first silently chant this incantation seven times. And that's all you need to prevent the toxins from causing harm. This is still Zhang Jiebin that's reporting what was in another Buddhist book. And so here's the incantation. Well, I'm not going to read it to you. And I can't translate it because incantations are like magic word formulas and they don't necessarily translate. They're like magical words and sounds. But this is definitely like a Sanskrit mantra that's kind of been translated into Chinese characters and Chinese sounds. For example, the last phrase, mohesa, um, mohesa, means mahasattva, which is an important bodhisattva, right? So it has these Buddhist words in it, but I can't translate it. And then he says, so you're reciting this incantation seven times when you go someplace strange to eat. And if you see cobwebs on the food, don't eat it. I think that's good advice generally. But the cobwebs are like, remember that fungus, what it looked like? And the decayed silk floss thing. I, I think that's all referring to this fungus. Another method, if you enter such a place, you can avoid getting sick by reciting seven times out loud. It wants you to do it out loud. 10,000 blessings of the medicine king or Yao Wang Wan Fu. Um, so that one's easier to remember, right? It's only four syllables. <laughs> and so there's that mantra or that incantation. Um, and actually, I found the whole story. Like Zhang Jiebin doesn't tell you the whole story. Here's the whole story. 
um, a government official, so it's from another book, it's from a case study book from the Ming Dynasty. A government official was traveling west, so that means you know, through the region where the Uyghurs are now, or, you know, like towards the Silk Roads, that, that kind of area. So he was traveling west with an eminent monk. On the road from someplace called Guisha, they passed through a distant wasteland with no place to stop. It was afternoon and they were just so hungry and discouraged traveling through this like empty land and there was a small cottage but they had already heard that the people who lived there raised goo but they were so hungry they just had to eat anyway it says there's no difference between going and staying they were going to die if they went because they were starving and they might die if they stayed because of the goo so so they decided to eat the monk said I have a divine incantation so we can eat without worry. When the food arrived, the monk closed his eyes and kept reciting this incantation. And presently, a small spider appeared on the edge of the bowl. The monk quickly killed it, and then they could eat without any harm. Here's the incantation. And while there may be some minor differences, but this is basically the same incantation that we saw from Zhang Jie Bin. And then after that, they passed on the incantation so other people could use it. Because <laughs> it's magic, goo is magic. And so you can use magic to treat it or prevent it. I found this other thing um, recently. Um, another Ming Dynasty doctor said, immortals have passed down an incantation method to resolve goo goo toxins whenever you enter a place that you think they're going to poison you with it right as you enter first silently recite the incantation three times or seven times and here's the incantation i include the pinion for incantations just in case somebody wants to chant it <laughs> um and this one i could more or less translate i mean it may not be perfect but i could still get the idea and it's so weird Father is an earthworm beetle bug. Mother is a silk net snake woman. They have 7,000 descendants. The bug and the snake woman have 7,000 children. <laughs> I will always recognize you. So it, you can see like the words are just strange, but the previous incantation was even more incomprehensible. So, so this is still from the same thing where it says, you know, um, they, wait a minute, which story is this? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, just whenever you go in a place that has goo, then you chant that. Um, for the above, when you first enter the door, silently communicate 10,000 blessings to the goo toxins. That's weird. Raise your eyes straight up from your left hand okay look up from your left hand um or maybe it means on the left side count the ceiling rafters everywhere i don't know why they're so obsessed with ceiling rafters because before it said if the ceiling rafters are really clean it's a goo household so now you're counting the ceiling rafters and then bow your head if there's tea wine or food then sneak your left hand into your clothing and here's the weirdest thing pull out one strand of pubic hair and put it on the plate okay um tell the goo to return to its master and then silently recite the incantation three times if there's some goo in the food the chong the snake or the bug or the worm will come out of the food on the plate but if you actually see the pubic hair that you pulled out tied to the chong then the master the goo master will be struck by his own goo isn't this bizarre uh yeah i don't think i'm gonna pull pubic hairs when i'm out to eat are you um okay Um, let's see. So we're back to Zhang Jiebin. Um, Maxta, okay. It says for any type of goo toxins, apply three cones of direct Maxta to the tip of each little toe. It's possible that this means 
UB67, Jiyin, but it's also possible it actually means the tip. I looked at description of point location, and sometimes it says UB67, a tenth of a ton from the corner of the nail, and sometimes it says at the tip of the little toe. So uh, this doesn't necessarily mean the absolute tip end. It could, it could be UB67, or it could mean the tip. Sorry, I don't know. So you apply three cones of moxa, and then these are big enough cones that you're going to make a moxa sore, and something will come out of the moxa sore. If the goo was in wine, then rice wine, rice wine will come out. If it was in food and drink, food and drink will come out of the moxa sore. This is effective every time. Isn't that weird? <laughs> um, okay. Now there's a whole bunch of stuff from another book. Maybe I should stop. Any questions at this point? And if I don't see you, please just turn on your mic and speak. Okay. I did have a question. So, okay. So um, from those point locations that you're referencing, this is not about, my question is not about goo, but uh, is it possible that, are, that some of those um, texts that you were referencing were locating you bladder 67 at the tip of the toe as opposed to next to the toenail? I mean, it, it's possible. Okay. Um, but the old books, you know, the really, really old books are going to be less precise in their description of point location. And, you know, Ming Dynasty books are going to be more descriptive in their point location. And I think in the early books, you know, the printing wasn't in a good state, things had to be hand copied. So they used fewer words in order to, you know, not have to write so much. And it would be expected that you have a teacher. So if you knew, oh, yeah, that's the point at the tip of the little toe, and your teacher showed you, you don't have to write down everything, you just have to write down enough to get you in the ballpark. <clears throat> so it could be an alternate point location. And it could be, um, the moxa location for UB67, and it could be that it was just shorthand and, and you're supposed to know, yeah, it's at the corner of the nail. It's, you know, things that people assumed back then, we don't necessarily know to assume the same thing. So sometimes it's just unclear. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Um, so live snake goo, um, one of the symptoms it's talked about a lot is something moving around under the skin or inside the abdomen. Um, and so something two or three inches long can swell up under the skin and it can be jumping about. Um, and <laughs> when the patient eats meat, it calms down. So apparently the goo likes meat, according to this one. And sometimes the snake goo le leaps up to the heart. Um, mm, sometimes it can go away for four or five years, but then it takes on form again and, and bites. Um, and some can mutate into turtles and tortoises and bite. Um, but when the snake gets old, it'll slow down. But until it gets old, it bites on, from inside of the body can bite 20 or 30 times in a day. So this must be like some sudden sharp stabbing pain in the abdomen that moves around from place to place. Um, list some other symptoms. It can feel like being stung by ants. It's worse at night. Um, and, you know, some of these symptoms. So here's a story. There's a woman named Lee who was struck by these toxins. The internal snakes were five or six swim long, five or six inches long. How do they know? Well, it felt like something moving around and maybe they even saw things moving around. Ooh, there was an X-Files where there was something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, and so each day they bit her about 10 times, but she took one of the formulas that I'll talk about in a minute, and she didn't even need to avoid certain things that apparently are sometimes avoided, and she recovered in two months. So this book 
this um, Yanfang Xinbian is a Qing Dynasty book. The guy was a government official who his hobby was going around and collecting secret formulas if he could get someone to divulge them or folk formulas. And he wrote a lot about goo. And then I've translated excerpts from that in a book called Raising the Dead and Returning Life. Um, including a much longer passage about Gu than is in um, this slideshow. And he has four formulas plus a few others, but there's like a set of four formulas that he feels are very good for treating Gu. And actually later people mention those formulas all the time, but they're not in Bensky, these formulas. So I have one of these formulas in this slideshow, but if you want all the other formulas, you have to buy the book. <laughs> um, so uh, is, am I in the right place? Yeah. Someone who's weak should often drink a tea. Um, you know, I mean, it's not literal tea, but like decoct or, well, he does say cha. So maybe it includes like, tea in it okay but should often drink a tea made by boiling zisuye and boha um so peppermint and perilla what's that called shiso in japanese um yeah those two you know pretty mild herbs but aromatic fairly aromatic someone so that's for someone who's weak just those two herbs someone who's strong should be treated by taking these four formulas in the su um Suha Tang family. There's like a he has four formulas that are related, you know, to each other. And the Su is for Zusu Ye and the He is for Bo he. Okay. So like his formulas for someone who's strong use these same two herbs plus a whole bunch of other herbs. Um, and so we'll see one of those formulas in a minute. He continues to say. A custom of the Zhuang ethnic group, and again, they're in the south of China, there are minority people in the south of China, is to bury snakes in the earth to grow a poisonous fungus. So we've already, you know, seen that kind of idea. The victim's mind becomes cloudy and his head's dizzy. He can laugh or scold people. If he drinks alcohol, he gets more violent and um, angry. And when it becomes uncontrollable, he lapses into madness. And again, these four formulas are what would treat it and no sex. <laughs> um, there's a golden silkworm type of goo that's made from a particular type of silkworm. You could read about it. Um, this golden silkworm goo doesn't fear water, fire, swords, or spears. It's the most difficult type to eliminate. In other words, if you actually see the goo, like some squirmy thing, and you try to like drown it or set it on fire, it's not gonna kill it. We'll see a story about that soon. It only fears stabbing. When somebody who, you know, then there's some more tests if they have um, goo, you could tell if it's goo or not by these two sentences. Um, and it feels like a hundred insects are crawling on it after you, you know, take, I guess, the herbal formula. Um, but then you can induce vomiting with the bark of the root of pomegranate, if I read that correctly. Okay, so here's the formula. And actually, <laughs> I found out like that, you know, I'm in this Facebook group called Scholars of Chinese Medicine and somebody asked, what is goo just the other day? And um, one really amazing person who does some translation named Will Curvels, who's in Taiwan, he posted a video I didn't know he had, which does talk a little bit about goo, but he talked about this formula, like this is the formula for goo. And apparently this is, um, the formula that Heiner Fruhoff uses in his product line for goo, but he's modified it, but it's still this basic idea. So, and looking in Chinese on the internet, 
this book that I'm translating from is the first book with this formula. Like that's where this formula came from is, is this translation that I have. So you can see it, it starts with Zhu Suye and Bo He, peppermint and that shiso leaf. Um, and it has mostly herbs that we know and can easily get, Qing Hao and Lian Chao and um, Huai Hua, which is the flower of Sephora tree, and Xuan Qian, Chai Hu, Chuan Qiong, and Sheng, and Huang Qi that's not been processed. But this one, Chao Shen, is like, I found it's Latin, um, and I don't know what that is. But still, if we have almost all of the herbs in this formula, we can basically make this formula and substitute something for that or not. Um, so anyway, I mentioned this is from Raising the Dead and Returning Life, um, which if you look on Amazon or you can search for the Chinese Medicine Database, which is the publisher. If it's snake goo, then they want you to add some other herbs. And so have the patient take it. If the disease improves, then you've got the right formula. If they take it for a long time, they'll recover. And then he describes what the herbs do in the formula. And this one that I don't know what it is, this chow shen is supposed to clear fire from the lungs and disperse swelling and distension. So maybe we can find another herb that does a similar thing. Um, generally for formulas to treat goo, <clears throat> the main idea doesn't go beyond stuff to kill snakes, resolve toxins and send the toxins out of the body and vanquish the toxins. It's like, wow, yeah, you have to deal with the toxins. He's got three listings for toxins. Um, anyway, there's a formula if you suspect goo has been used. Um, so here, I was going to say that about my um, teacher who, you know, was afraid of goo and made the food so hot by adding so much hot sauce on it. Um, I was going to mention that here, but that's fine. It says, bring your own garlic and eat it, um, but it's going to make you vomit the goo out. Um, and another formula, this actually sounds doable. I was just looking up today water chestnuts and Apparently, you can buy them fresh in Asian supermarkets. So, you know, you don't want the canned water chestnuts. Get fresh water chestnuts, slice them and um, dry them in the sun and then grind them into powder. And then if you're in a region that has goo, you can take them um, and then you won't get harm if you enter a place that has goo. He says it's miraculous. <laughs> That's what a water chestnut looks like up here at the top um yeah over there so okay. any Can I ask a yes. question yes um, yes is there herbs working as well on a more uh chi level or spiritual level or are these really treating the physical toxins or is this something you, you'll get to i think that this I think that the old doctors, while this was like magic, they weren't thinking like the incantations are kind of, you know, spiritual and without substance, but like goo is something that has substance and, you know, causes physical symptoms. And while it can cause madness, but it also causes all these physical symptoms. I think they're really looking at this pretty literally and not like, it's some spiritual kind of attack. I mean, or a black magic sort of. Well, it is black magic, but that black herbs magic. aren't treating on that level, or are there herbs that would treat that? Because I guess you're treating. I they don't, don't know talk about, about it that way. Yeah. I mean, you could come up with your ideas about like why these herbs are working from a different perspective, but they really, I mean, look at what he said um, that each herb does. Um, drains heart fire, vanquishes toxins, enters the lungs and heart and spleen, kills snakes, releases the exterior, enters the lungs and kills goo. I mean, they're not talking about like Shen stuff or Hun no, stuff. No, it feels very physical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they're looking at this as very tangible. Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, well, it might be chi, but it's still like, you know, there's not the like, sort of, yeah, I think you understand what I'm. Yeah. Um, so to treat it on a spiritual level, then they would use those matches. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Or maybe a talisman or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, Back in I mean, Eric? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you're good. Oh, uh, so were there more like spell book type things back then? Oh yeah, like mantras. So they're like Taoist, so-called spiritual stuff. I mean, like our Western idea of spiritual, I don't think is exactly gonna fit. Like, you know, we're forcing Chinese concepts into our Western words, <laughs> but uh, you know, Taoist and Buddhist remedies, you, you might go to your doctor and get herbs, but then you might also go to your Buddhist priest or your Taoist priest and get, you know, um, like talismans and, and so forth, um, you know, incantations and other types of magical remedies. Oh, you know, burning the goo and, and eating, taking it as a remedy. I mean, they burn talismans, Chinese culture. You know, you have a talisman, somebody writes a talisman that's empowered and then it gets burnt to ash and then you swallow it, you know, stir it in water and drink it. That's a spiritual remedy. So maybe the burning the goo is also on a spiritual level like that. Um, but, but this is, really uh, i mean it's black magic but it's still a very physical you know they can't do it from afar for example <laughs> you know it has to be in your food or somehow get to you it's you know i don't know how to explain i think it is it is interesting that it's uh talking about like oh this is a magical ailment but approaching it from like a medical perspective of how to treat it i mean not, not obviously not all of them are strictly medical but i do think it's interesting that that's, that's yeah that's well these doctors are talking about it doctors gonna doctor and priests gonna priest <laughs> you know so i mean how would a doctor approach this except by herbs or moxa or acupuncture um there's certainly they may include an incantation but like they make their money with herbs i'm not saying they're doing it for money but i mean that's their toolbox is herbs so if you go to a doctor you're going to get herbs if you go to a priest you're going to get a talisman <laughs> um so it's the modality that they use um so i don't think it's so surprising so yeah this has a magical aspect but it still has a very physical thing it's not like you can give someone goo from afar you can't give someone goo through zoom <laughs> you can't you know there has to be contact um so so it does have magical aspects but it also and then it has medical symptoms and um, yeah i think we're trying to fit it into like spiritual is here and physical is there but in chinese culture it's not so separated we're separated <laughs> it's not um I, I also think because it's such an evil act that there may be yeah because of our understanding we try and bring something dark to it well it is dark and evil yeah and, but, you know john jay been thought so too yeah. <laughs> um but it's like i think that's my problem is separating spiritual into an independent thing you know from the physical aspects of it. I don't think, at least in this, I don't think you can separate the two. Um, and it just, you know, doctors use herbs as their toolbox, but the patient may go to more than one type of healer. Mm. Am I done with this slide? Oh, so what are chestnuts, powder? Hey, if you're worried about goo, I think, you know, if you go to a Chinese, supermarket you can probably according to the internet find some fresh water chestnuts and make this if you're traveling through southern china or something the bottom formula here okay um 
it says that if you are drinking alcohol, when you get goo, it will be hard to treat. But if you weren't drinking alcohol, when you got goo, it'll be easier to treat. However, in Southern China, there are a lot of miasmas, you know, like all these weird diseases that are probably things like malaria and all these tropical diseases that aren't in the north of China. And it says that they think that drinking alcohol helps prevent all these miasmic diseases. So he says, in short, drink a lot when you're at home where you know the food's okay. But it's wonderful to drink less when you go out because you might get goo out there. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, stories and cases of goo. I had fun getting all the bug images. I hope they're not freaking you out. I hope, like, maybe I should have had a trigger warning. Uh, uh, okay, so then this is from a case study book. In a certain year, a provincial governor, family named Chang, um, held military power over the western border region. So we saw a lot of it's in the south, but we saw that other case with the incantation was when they were heading west. So I guess the west, which also has its minorities, you know, people of Turkic origin and um, so forth. Anyway, so he had like some western border region under his power, Governor Chang. Um, he was reviewing a case of violent death by Gu. The perpetrators, the perps, were already securely in prison. And based on the documents, the woman who raised the Gu had noticed, ooh, look, there's a wealthy house over there. And she knew the owners had gone off to do some trade because this is near the silk groves, right? So she, the owners had gone to do some trade and would be bringing back valuable goods. And so she wanted to get those goods. So she was going to use Gu to get the stuff from the person from the merchant. She asked an old woman who was the neighbor to this rich house to go to the house and, and just say, hi, long time no see, how you been, missed you. <laughs> but then the neighbor woman could take advantage of getting inside. And apparently she was supposed to have some goo in her fingernail and fling it at the guy. <laughs> really weird. Um, so the potential victim thought something was wrong and they grabbed her and took her into the authorities. And then when they investigated, they found the truth. So there's so far there's an old woman and then there's the woman who does makes the goo. And there's also going to be her husband. So they're like three perpetrators. Based on the confession, I don't know if this is the confession of the old woman or if this is the confession of the younger woman who makes the goo but anyway based on oh this is the younger woman who has the goo the woman already had 19 goo that were attached to her like her pets right um when she got married and after she got married she and her husband killed six more people so her goo increased to 25 in this story, it seems like every time you kill someone, you get one more goo. That it's not just something you make from snakes, but it's somehow something you get when you murder someone. Um, there's still may, there's still Chong involved. There's still these creepy crawlies involved, but somehow they have to be animated, I guess, by the dead person. So, so she had 19 when she got married, they killed six people and now she has 25 group. Authorities investigated and they found reliable evidence for three of the six people she had killed because they found two sets of bones and then they found one dead body in the house. Yeah, not good people. I, this is Gover Governor Chung um, writing, I found the case strange. I didn't really believe it. So the next day I called the woman in and I interrogated her myself and she told me everything. She confessed to everything and I ordered her to show me the goo and she brought out an empty bamboo tube and it looked like there was nothing in it. And the woman, since she was confessing everything, said this hall of law is like a sacred place and evils don't dare enter it. 
So first we have to make some offerings to the deity of the building before he will let them in the deity before the deity will let them in something like that so we made offerings or whatever it was they wanted to do and then some squirming red goo appeared in the tube so i ordered an officer to trample step on them stomp on them um and to try and make them into a watery pulp but the officer said they're not dead yet so i ordered the woman to call out any goo that were still in the tube and they were still the same number so she had 25 they got 25 out he stomped on them but they weren't dead and then she called again and there were 25 more um because of this we searched for various ways to exterminate the goo we put them in a stone casket and sealed it up with talismans paper you know that had talismans written on it and threw it in the river and that did the job and then it goes on and explains some more. The harm done by goo is extremely toxic. It's said that hedgehogs can catch goo and remove their badness. So we don't have hedgehogs in the US, but we have possums and possums eat ticks. I wonder if possums could eat goo. Anyway, people don't really know that goo is is not all the same the most toxic type even if you try to cut it with a knife or smash it to pieces with a rock or set it on fire or bury it in the ground it's still you can't kill it that way goo attaches itself to women so there's this like gendered thing again that women are the evil ones and minority people are the evil ones <laughs> um when it strikes people they immediately die after dying their belongings are transported by the goo to the person to benefit the person who raised it. Every time someone is killed, the goo is increased by one. Some people say that the paw of the murder victim becomes attached and is turned into goo. So that's why, like, if she had, you know, killed, you know, six more people and then she got six more goo, it's because she was able to somehow get the pro, which is the spirit of the lungs and um, yeah, creepy. So the case study book credits it to some other book, we don't really care, but this was so hard to translate and I really had some problems with it. So somebody, a really amazing person named Leo Locke helped me with it. I mean, I did the main translation, but then he helped correct where I was confused. So thanks, Leo. Um, so how do you like that story? Um, okay, I think the rest of these, maybe not all of them, but there's like a bunch of them that's from Tales of the Strange. So everything up until now has been from medical books. And now these last few descriptions of goo are from Tales of the Strange from a very early book. You can see the dates. Wow, before, you know, 322 CE. Um, so these are pretty early, just little stories. These are not medical stories, although that you might get some medical information from it. So the husband and my wife's sister had a servant that lived in his house. Um, the servant got sick with blood in his stool, and the doctor thought it was struck by goo. So they secretly, so there's a little bit of magic here. If they're going to do something secretly, that means there's a little bit of magic. This herb called Rang Ho Gun under his sleeping mat and didn't tell him. You would think he would smell it because this is a type of ginger. <laughs> um, at least that's what that refers to today maybe sometimes herbs are different at different times um so then the doctor used some crazy words and the doctor said the one who fed me goo was Zhang xiao xiao um he then shouted xiao xiao is destroyed so again a little bit of magic <laughs> at the present many people use this herb for attack by goo and it's often effective so some special kind of ginger under your bed, under your sleeping mat. Here's another ghost story from Tales of the Strange. Um, 
with a book called Records of Searching for Spirits. Somebody had goo talks and dogs. There's also goo cats. Um, so that seems to be a different thing, though, than like the snakes and, and so forth. Um, so one time someone visited that guy and suddenly six or seven big yellow dogs came out and barked at him. I don't see why that means that he had goo dogs though. Later, somebody else came back to their hometown and ate with this ghoul master's wife. And then he vomited blood and nearly died. He only recovered by drinking a preparation of jagum, which is an herb that we use. Um, so this is implying that there was goo in the food. And then he says, goo toxins have strangeness similar to ghosts. Their demonic form transmutes into random things in different types. It can become dogs or pigs or creepy crawly things or snakes. The people who use goo all know the form of the type that they use. Like, you know, this person might have like a snake type and that person might have a dog type and somebody else might have a cat type. So they each have their own type and then they do it to common people and whoever they hit with it dies. And generally the idea is that then somehow they get the riches from the person that they poisoned. And another story, I like this one. A family somewhere um, practiced goo for many generations using it to become wealthy. Later, one of them got a new wife but didn't tell her about the goo stuff. So one day the whole family went out but the new wife stayed home. And she's looking around, poking around, and she notices a large jar. And she opens it, and oh my goodness, there's a large snake in there. So she pours boiling water on the snake to kill it. The family came back, and she just told them what happened. And the whole family was alarmed and regretted it because their goo was killed. And soon after, they got sick and they all died because they didn't have the goo magic somehow protecting them. Um, this is the last slide that I want to um, talk about. Okay, so secretary, somebody got struck by goo toxins, and he ran into someone who said, I invite you to come to see me in the morning, but don't eat. And then he asked the victim to open his mouth towards the light so that he could look in, and he held up a seal, you know, like sometimes they're called a chop. He held up a seal and waited. And then out came a small red snake about two tsun long and shaped like a hairpin. And so this guy who's like helping quickly ordered fire and burned the goo that came out. And then the other guy um, recovered. The last few slides, ugh, I don't want to talk about, but... I, what I want, I, I just want to tell you like the general idea. There's something called drum distension and there's something else called goo distension, but they're both pronounced the same way and they get confused with each other or mixed with each other. It's not clear the difference between them. So uh, I just found a bunch of quotes. Here's stuff from Practical Dictionary of Chinese Medicine. What is goo distension? The, the goo that we've been talking about. What is drum distension? You know, so that's some um, description of it. And then, you know, there's like some quotes about it. And it's like, they don't all agree. Um, but it's too confusing for me to keep track of. So you could read those on your own or not, but no harm in me leaving them in here for you to look at or to ignore. So that's what that is. Um, yeah. So as I said, there's a guy in, in, in Portland, Heiner Fruhoff, who works at NUNM, which is the naturopathic school that also has a Chinese medicine program. And he's kind of done a lot of research into Gu, and he is the guy that, you know, feels that things like weird, creepy diseases like Lyme disease and stuff like that are 
um, a manifestation of gu. It may not be that somebody was trying to poison you, but that it comes out the same. And he's made a line of herbs that you can take. And, and the ones for gu are related to that formula that I gave you, the su he, um, tang, whatever that was. Um, if you search for his name plus Gu, you're gonna find um, you know, things that he wrote or interviews with him. And when I read it, I find it really convincing. He's really, really convincing. But when I'm not reading it, I'm skeptical. <laughs> so you know, you can decide what you think on your own now that you know like what Gu has been historically. Um you know, and like the ultimate thing is if his formulas heal people with Lyme disease, then who's going to argue whether it's good or not? I mean, if the formulas work, that's great. But I'm still not convinced that that's historical goo. But what do I know? Um, so that's my slideshow. And so I want to thank Eric and the emperors and all of you guys. And now I'm ready for more questions or discussion. So I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Hi, humans. What do you think? Is it weird? I think some of those stories at the end were really wild. Well, should the I woman stop in the um, police oh. getting interviewed. Yeah, that was a really amazing story. I had such problems translating it, though. Thank you, Leo, for helping me. But yeah, that's a really wild story. Anything else? Um, I was wondering, so the family who was practicing goo for many generations, you know, I, I with a new wife. Right. Toward, yeah. The, in that case, um, and in all the cases, it was goo's always a like a malevolent thing, like a dark thing that someone's doing to someone else, not just something like oh they're doing bug magic and to gain to get you know bring wealth to their family or something, right? Well, they are trying to benefit themselves, but only by harming others. Okay. You know, so so why would they do it? Because somehow magically, if you kill me with goo, my possessions somehow are transported back to you. So, you know, greedy people do stuff. I mean, today, like, you know, there's this California, like, what was it? Like middle class, you know, thing. And they sent out a credit card, like with $350 to a lot of people um and mine was uh you know somebody ripped it off before i even um activated it it's so weird but they're they're going to give me another so it's like people are greedy and they don't care who they harm and they you know will steal your money they'll you know steal your possessions they'll you know people are, have always been bad so <laughs> not everyone of course Yeah. So um, can you remind us when the oracle bones, this is, I should have asked this question way earlier, but when are the oracle bones from? Is that from the Shang dynasty? Shang dynasty, and that would be like, like maybe 3000 BCE and earlier, um, going back a very long time, you know, like for a couple thousand years before that. So. Are there other concepts that we're still talking about in Chinese medicine today that date back that long ago? Maybe not. But of course, what they meant in the oracle bones may not be what it meant later. Oh, you know what I wanted to say and I forgot to say? Like there is this concept in Chinese culture. It's maybe more of a folk concept, but um, tooth worms. And so if somebody had cavities or, you know, like a rotting tooth, then it's tooth worms. 
Um, and so that in the oracle bones, they were asking, you know, sick tooth, is it goo or something like that? So like you can see tooth worms may have come been the same thing as goo back then. It may not have been malevolent back then. It may have just been like the universe doesn't like me and my teeth. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. So did you want to talk about Matula Shakur? Sure. Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this reading group also functions as a fundraiser. So this time again, we're raising funds for Dr. Matulu Shakur, who was recently released from prison. So in exchange for watching this or attending, we're asking that you make a modest donation of five to ten dollars to his uh, funds. You know, that includes you watching the video. <laughs> people watching the video at home too. Uh, we are asking that you make a donation. So you can do that at matulushakur.com slash support. And I'm going to drop the link into the chat box. Um, but there is a lot of information about him and his contributions to Chinese medicine acupuncture in this country. Uh, you can watch the movie on YouTube called Dope is Death. And you can also read more about him on his website. But uh, he did a lot for um, pioneering the NADA protocol into, you know, get using, developing that and using acupuncture for uh, addiction treatment.